Okay, it looks like Richard's got a, a couple of questions here. Um, all right, so Richard's trying to set up an alert to trigger on a pullback. So, for example, um, for a long, a long must be must be uh, a down candle, and for shorts must be an an up candle. All right, so he wants the signal. So he wants a signal when price uh, gets within one tick of a moving average, and is that possible? Uh, yes, it definitely is. All right, so Richard wants to only use the closing price. So Richard wants to see when the closing price gets within one tick of a moving average. Um, all right, let's see, let's let delete that. And let's see, let's get rid of chameleon here. All right, so Richard had mentioned um, looking at when the closing price gets within one tick of, say, our red moving average. So, all right, some possibilities might be here. Um, but we're looking at the closing price. So this would not count because that's the wick of the bar. There we go. Here's another one. Oh, oh, let's see. Um, yeah, so there's another possibility. All right. Okay, this bar here actually looks like the best, the best setup here. kind of fade that white line in the background. There we go. All right, so we have a, uh, a down bar, right? And it looks like it could be hopefully within one tick of, let's see, 53. Yeah, it's hard to say for sure, but um, the closing price of this down bar might be within one tick um, of our EMA 55, right? The red moving average. Okay, so um, all right, so let's we'll work on building some solvers to look for this situation. And, all right, I'm going to create a new logic template. And let's see, um, trying to think of a name to call this thing. Uh, one tick. Um, All right, so we want to look for the closing price um, to be one tick um, from the EMA. All right, or yeah, one tick within the EMA. Um, all right, so what we're doing is we're doing a we're comparing right the closing price. So we're going to be. Um, All right, so we're comparing the closing price here to the EMA, All right? We're doing a, a comparison to see if these are within one tick of each other. So let's grab a comparison solver. And let me name this. So, see, typically we want, you know, the faster moving 
piece of data inside the indicator A setting here. So I will, uh, so the closing price is, moves faster than a moving average, right? Price always moves faster than a moving average. So I'll just change the type to the closing price as a little shortcut there. And the next indicator B, I will change that over to our EMA 55. like so and so now we want to know right when they're within one tick of each other so we're going to do something like this we're going to set our large amount and small amount to one tick and um, let's see if I click off sometimes I have to click off in order to get the uh, in order to get the, the names in here to update. But now you can see it says A greater than B by one tick or more, right? A greater than B by just one tick. And then we have this neutral area. So this is really what we're looking for is, is this neutral area where A is you know within B. So in other words, when the closing price is within the EMA um, of, by one tick. Right, so we can see we have this upper level and lower level that kind of define this one tick above and it defines this one tick below. So I'll need to go through and change my outputs to reflect, you know, what I'm actually looking for. All right, so that's what I'm looking for. So just just this solver on its own will tell me when the closing price is within one tick. And it didn't quite meet our situation there. Um, here we go. This did. So, so we can see here the closing price is basically right on that moving average. So it's within one tick. And so we're getting, you know, so this solver, right, so just this one solver you know, is telling us, you know, hey, you know, our condition, our situation has been met. Price is within one tick. But now, and so now we can start adding some other requirements to this. So one of the requirements is that um, for an up signal, um, Richard wants a down bar. So he wants price to be moving down, um, right? So so it looks like, you know, Richard wants price to be moving down uh, onto the moving average and then bouncing off. All right. So we're looking, so we want a down bar coming down and approaching the moving average. And he wants uh, to generate a long signal off of that. So it kind of sounds like Richard's looking for a bounce straight here, a bounce off of this moving average. So, um, yeah. And, um, Let's see, I'm just going to, yeah, all right. So after I show this example here, um, Richard, I'll show you an old workshop video that actually has a little more complex, a little more complex system than what I'm going to show you now. I'll kind of show you the basics, but this is, has been built and there is a uh, recorded workshop of this. Um, all right, so the next requirement that we're going to add to this that Richard wanted is right the down bar. He wanted a down bar to to be in place in order to get a long signal. So let's use um, the bar direction. He wants it to be a down bar. So if you use the bar direction, you got to keep in mind that the bar actually has to have a body. Um, if it's a doji, Right, that's not a down, a doji's not a down bar or an up bar. So we can see here there's three dojis right here. Um, and so there's no, right, so there's no output because there's no body to it. Um, so you may need to refine your logic on this. So if, if you know, if, um, um, if really what you're looking for is just the closing price of the previous bar or closing price of the current bar, to be less than the previous closing price, you know, then that would be a, a yeah, that would require a different solver if you just want to compare closing prices to see if 
if the price is moving down versus the bar moving down. That would be a, um, we could use a comparison solver to compare, you know, if, if, if the closing price is moving down, you know, in, versus using the, the bar direction. But for now, I'll just use the bar direction. I'll keep this kind of simple. Um, right. So we can see that this down bar generated a short output, but we actually want a long output. So, um, you know, so first thought might be, oh, let's, let's invert it. And, you know, that actually looks great. It did reverse it, but technically inverted it because look, look at these dojis. We now have a long and a short output. So that's not quite what we want. We actually literally do want to reverse them. So we're going to use, um, there's a couple things we can use. Um, let's see, I think I'll just, I'll pick the inverter here. All right, get that connected up. Um, the inverter has this swap, right? We can swap the long and short. In other words, you know, kind of reverse the long and shorts. Um, but it's also doing an inversion. So we need to turn off this invert, right? We actually don't want to invert the long side. We're going to turn that off. We don't want to invert the short side. Um, we really just want to swap them. Um, and actually, let's see. Oh, I forgot to turn my my bar direction. I forgot to turn the invert off, so let's turn that off. There we go. All right. So with the inverter node, we've turned off the inverts. Turn those off. And we can see nothing's changed, right? This down bar still gives us a short output. So as soon as we swap them, now it, it actually reversed everything. And we can see the dojis are still dojis since they don't have an output. So we actually literally reversed um, the output versus um, inverting the output. So there's a, there is a difference there. All right, now let's go back to our comparison solver. Now you'll notice our comparison solver, it's giving us a long and a short output. And I kind of did that on purpose. Right. So if we look at the outputs, right, we can see in the long output, I have a one in the neutral, and the short output has a one in the neutral as well. So that's how that's why we're getting a long and a short at the same time. And we're allowing other solvers to kind of filter out whether this is going to be a long or a short trade. So in this example, we're going to use the bar direction to filter out whether it's a long or short trade, right? Because when we look at, uh, let me get this over here, oops. Oh, sorry about that. I had my site Skype set to do not disturb. I don't know what happened. Um, okay, so back to the bar direction. Um, so we can see the bar direction Right, it's only giving us an output in one direction, one or the other. So this is actually going to be choosing what direction the signal is in. So now what we need to do is and them together. Right, connect that and in. Right, so with just the comparison solver, we have two outputs, and as soon as I connect our bar direction, our reversed bar direction, now we can see right the signals now a, a clear signal has been been given based on the bar direction right so there we go so like in this example right there's our nice little long bounce trade off of that moving average like so and unfortunately we didn't really get a bounce short in this situation so but we did get a bounce long afterwards Right, so there we go. Um, so that's kind of the, the the gist of how that logic would be put together, and you know, and 
you may need other kind of filters to be put in here you know so like you might want to design some kind of a, a trend system so that way you're kind of maybe looking at the bigger trend of price you know to kind of hopefully hopefully you know like uh, filter out you know like the short signal here you know you might you'll want to probably add some more logic to this to you know try and filter out this short signal uh, since you know we can kind of see that we don't really seem to be in much of a downtrend there definitely is some minor kind of downtrend so obviously you know this is first bounce to work but the second bounce yeah it didn't quite work so um, all right so I had mentioned I would show you a workshop video that actually covers this same kind of uh, condition but in, in more detail. Um, so I'm going to go back to YouTube here and let's see um, I think we should find it under moving average balance. Yeah, here it is, the top one. All right, look at that. Google found it the first try. So this moving average bounce um, or kind of rejection, moving average kind of rejection of price um, is uh, the video that you want to watch there, uh, Richard. So um, and if you watch the video, let's see. Um, yeah, so there's two ways that you can get the logic template. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you can uh, find out the date when this video occurred and just email us and we'll email the file back to you. Or you can find the date and then go onto our website, you know, and go to the downloads section on our website here. Uh, there we go, template files. Right, and you can find you can find the template files on the website. So there's two ways you can get a hold of the uh, the workshop those workshop files. Okay, so Mike is asking uh, in Raven while using back test Ranko bars, how do I set up a limit entry? All right, so I guess the bar type doesn't matter. You know, a limit entry is a limit entry. Um, doesn't really matter what bar type you're using. You know, I guess really just think of these bar types as just a way of displaying price. You know, all the bars do is display price based on movement or based on a time period um, or based on like a number of contracts that go through. You know, so volume bars, right, obviously are based on the number of contracts. Um, you know, so it's accounting. So bars are either based on counting something. Bars are always counting something. They're either counting seconds or they're counting ticks of movement or they're counting contracts that's all you know bars are and so um, so when you're running a strategy or running an indicator it really doesn't matter what the bar is itself right because uh, it's just all just it's all the same price data right open high low and close um, so alright so with Raven um, if you want to use a limit order Right, we can see under section two here, uh, entry order options. We have use limit order. You can just set that to true. And so there's a couple of options in here. Um, so I'm going to skip over the first one here. And I'll get back to this later. So when you place a limit order, you know you have to decide how long do I leave that do I leave that limit order out. Um, you know, so for example, um, you know, it, um, actually, let me scroll back here. All right, so let's say we get this long signal, right? We get this long signal, it triggers, and we got, a, and we place a, a limit order. Um, 
So, and we place our limit order, you know, down here. So we want to try and get a better fill with the limit order. Um, you know, right? So it's a long signal. So price has to come down, penetrate, penetrate that limit order to pick it up. Um, and we look at the next bar, and oh, price didn't come down and pick us up. So what do we do? Do we cancel the order? Do we cancel the order? So you have to make a decision, you know, how many bars are you going to allow to go by before, you know, before you know or decide that, you know, hey, I should cancel this order. I'm not going to get picked up, right? So you have to know, like, have, have to decide how many bars you want to go by um, in order to, you know, cancel this limit order. All right, so let me set this back up. All right, so right now the default is five bars. So if five bars go by, um, the order is going to get canceled, right? So if you just want to allow one bar to go by, right, you can just set it to one, and all right, and it'll cancel after one bar. Um, and then the next decision you have to make is an offset uh, price. So this the offset is based from the closing price. Um, it's based from the last known closing price. So, okay, I'm going to have to close this out again. So, since the, since the long signal, right, was generated on this bar, it's going to use the, this bar's closing price to offset as its reference point for the offset, right? So if you want a five tick better fill, then you just use five ticks as your offset, um, and it's going to offset from the closing price of the bar. All right. So right now the default setting is is zero. Um, And also keep in mind there are some some help um, descriptions down in here for 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 these some of these settings here. Uh, so if if I want a better fill, what I want to want to the way I'll set a better fill up is I'll use a negative number. So if I go negative five, that's going to give me a better fill in both directions. So all right, so if it's a long signal it's going to place our limit order, you know, below the closing price. It's going to place our limit order down. If it's a short signal, then it'll place the limit higher. So a negative number is a better fill and price has to go out and, and grab you. If you use a positive number, so like if I go four, what it'll do is it'll throw your limit order, you know, up above the bid or ask, you know, um, and basically, what happens then is you don't actually get filled at that limit order. You know, the market regulations, um, you know, the CME regulations actually say that you need to get filled at the best possible price. So really what will happen is the exchange will take this limit order, you know, that's, you know, that could be one or two ticks above or below the best price and it'll actually move it down to wherever the best price is trading at and you'll actually get filled at a better price right so you know so if I set this you know something crazy like 10 ticks you know so if this is a long trade and I set this thing you know 10 ticks above the closing price that's you know that's way up here at 57 cents you won't get filled at 57 cents the market is actually gonna is actually going to take your limit order and fill you at wherever the ask price is, which will be much lower, and you'll get a better fill. So, all right. So typically, you know, if you're using limit orders, typically you're going to want to use negative numbers, um, right, to get a better fill. And a negative number means price has to come, come down or come up to fill your price. All right, Mike, I hope that uh, addresses that for you. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, so I'd mentioned also, uh, you know, on the uh, website here, you know, the website has a thorough explanation of that option as well. So if we go into documentation and go down to SI Raven. And let's see, if I look under parameters here, um, op, let's see, order entry options. There we go. So I can click on that. And there we go. It brings me down to that section. And so limit offset from entry. Right? So there's a, a pretty good detailed explanation of, of how that all works. Right. All right. So Richard, yeah, kind of has a general question about, you know, if I could recommend some various ways of, you know, determining trend. Um, you know, I guess in a way we really don't answer those questions because we're not trading coaches. Um, you know, and then of course if you go to a coach, well, he's going to teach you, you know, his methods that he likes to use for trend. And, you know, as, as Richard understands, there's so many ways to, to understand trend, um, you know, to, to determine trend uh, you know that's really such a broad wide open question it's really difficult to answer um, you know I guess it really come kind of comes down to your trading system as well as to which you know which indicator or you know method that best works for your your system for determining trend um, you know also the bar types can affect how trend is determined determined as well um, you know I, I you guys have noticed I like using range bars just because in, in these workshops because they look nice and clean you know range bars do cut out a lot of the chop that you see in minute bars and tick bars and and stuff and you know it does kind of show a, a trend pretty easily um, so I just like it because of their looks but um, you know if you're using a minute bar versus a range bar versus the Ranko bars you know, in indicators behave totally different, so I really can't, uh, I really don't have a good answer for you, Richard. Um, but one thing I can show you that we do have, um, we do have this SI trend uh, swing indicator, I'm sorry, SI swings indicator, um, which actually came from an indicator on big mics, so, um, which Dorshand uh, has created. So let me just get this on here real quick. Um, right, so this programmer Dorshand allowed us to use a couple of uh, his indicators and that's what that's what these solvers are based on. Right, this Dorshand swing trend and uh, this Dorshand swing volatility you know, these are two solvers that are looking at, you know, various aspects of his, of his indicator. Um, so, um, yeah, let's see. Yeah, so if we use the Dorsian Swing Trend and drop that in there. Let's see. Um, So you'll see that you know the that the trend that the indicator is in calculating internally is a little different than what it plots on the chart. So you can see that it's kind of basically it's looking at kind of the bigger swing trend. It's not really looking at the individual swing trends, um, right? So I don't know. Maybe that's something kind of helpful to you. So this is really based on price action, um, Dorshan's you know, trend, uh, trending logic, I guess you could say, is kind of based on price action. You can see that basically when, right here, when price breaks above, let me stretch this out again. So when price breaks ab above the prior, you know, swing high, then it tra changes that overall trend direction. And then price has to come down and break the prior low, right, the prior um, 
higher low and then the overall trend changes so I don't know maybe that's something helpful to you um, that's already you know built into Bloodhound so, um, these individual swing lines um, aren't really usable right because these swing lines are, are painted after the fact right you're always going to keep in mind that when you see indicators doing stuff like this it's always putting it in after the fact and let's see, yeah. here's one little trick that I like to do to test an indicator first I have to disconnect from my data feed in order to do this All right. so now what I can do is hit F5 on my chart okay so what we want to do is we want to watch the little piece of text and I'm using the arrow keys on my keyboard to step forward so I'm just stepping forward so we can see the line is still hasn't changed yet and boom we make a the low goes a little bit lower and then the line updates itself and look see if you hopefully you notice let me step back a little bit I'll hit F5 again all right now no indicator can predict that this is actually going to be the swing low so price moves higher nothing changes right and then price moves finally moves high enough and then the indicator is able to decide that oh yep that actually was a swing low and it took it two bars so just something to keep in mind you know with some of these indicators you know when you look at them historically they look fantastic it's like wow I can trade that and make a million dollars well if that was the case wouldn't we all be doing that so um, alright so yeah Richard I hope you know I hope maybe this indicator will, will help you out a little bit next uh, we have Virgil here alright can you show the logic on the swing trend solver chart See, can you show the logic on that swing trend solver chart? Um, oh, okay. I think you're talking about this one, Virgil. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. So let me open that up. Um, so this was all generated by just one simple solver. Right, so it's just the, the Dorshan Swing Trend Solver. That's all it is. So if you go to your solvers list, right, it's, um, uh, oh, sorry, this is organized um, alphabetically. So uh, the Swing Trend, there you go, Swing Trend right there on top. And that's all it is. I just threw it on there, you know, with um, the default settings here with a swing sensitivity of three All right so if you want you know if you want to look at the original indicator I know it's on big mics it might be on ninja traders download section and I'm trying to remember the original name um, The original name might be the price action swing. Yeah, I think the original name is price action swing. So, Alright, so uh, yeah, if you want to find the original indicator, but uh, yeah, just to kind of get this uh, kind of trend filtering, you know, um, output here from the solver, uh, yeah, just drop the solver into your system, and there you go, that's what it is. So. Alright, so Leo's looking at a comparison of the Pro Ranko bars and the Uno Ranko bars. Um, the Unoranko bars are a little more flexible because they allow you to specify the reversal period. 
whereas the Pro Ranko has a fixed reversal formula. Um, and the Pro Ranko is really, it was, we created it for the next gen um, company, for John Novak. All right, that's the type of bar that he likes to use, and he asked us to create it for him in, in his, in his, um, for his company, in his trade rooms. Um, so that's really how it came about. Um, let's see, off the top of my head, I don't know if the Unirenko calculates the same as the Pro Ranko or not. Um, I guess the easy thing to do is just uh, put both bars on there. Let's see if I have both bars. And I do. All right. So let's see. Um, let's put the Pro Ranko on here. And all right, let's make some. We'll make some big bars. Okay, seven two. And hmm, I don't remember if the Unirenko synchronizes on a daily or not. So I'll just set this to on. We'll add another. We'll add another data series to the chart. This time we'll set it to the Unirenko trend tick. Okay, I think trend tick. I think that should be. I think that's the body size and the reversal. Let's see. What's the reversal is 13. So I'll set this to 13. The Pro Ranko reversal is calculated at 13. And the the tick. Oh, the open offset. Okay, actually that um, trend tick is actually 2. The open offset. It's either 7 or 5. I have to do some experimenting to see. Um, all right, we'll just generate two days of Ranko bars here. Let's make sure that the sessions, make sure the session template is the same. And okay, we'll see how that works out. I'm just going to change the colors here so that we can make a dis distinction between them. them both on the same panel so that they overlay on each other and let's see let's see what we get I need to scroll to the very beginning of the chart here to kind of do a fair analysis and see what's happening. Hmm. It 
looks like they start off a little differently for some reason. Yeah. Oh. All right. I think actually this open this open tick offset does need to be set to 5. So maybe they'll match up now. And yeah, that looks a little better. Um, yeah, that looks much better. For some reason they're not matching up exactly. I did see a couple areas where they're not matching exactly. Um, Hold on, I got a couple of these colors reversed. Let's there we go. Well, for the most part, they look like they're calculating very similar. So, hmm. Yeah, there's a couple of times where they're slightly off. So it looks like they do have some slight uh, difference in formula. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what that is. But, you know, really bottom line is, um, you know, it just comes down to, you know, what you like. Um, you know, what, you know, if you're into Rankos, it just kind of, you know, there's a lot of different variances on Rankos. Um, so it just kind of comes down to, you know, what, which one you like to use. And there we go. Fix my chart back up. You know, I can't really say, I wouldn't really say one's better than the other. You know, it's just whatever you start using and, you know, whatever you start building a, a system off of uh, is really what it comes down to. You know, all bar types can be traded using different methodologies. I wouldn't necessarily say one's better than the other. You know, I've seen guys, you know, who can trade a one-minute bar in a three-minute bar you know, just as good as, you know, someone could trade these Ranko bars. You know, it just kind of comes to, comes down to whatever you get your mindset uh, uh, set to using. So, all right, so what Andre is wanting to, wanting to, uh, I guess, recognize is, you know, like this is clearly a high point. We have several bars, several bars, prior, you know, moving up, um, right, so we have several bars, you know, moving up in a motion like that, and then afterwards, we have several bars moving down afterwards, um, and then he also wants to be able to determine low points such as this, right, so once again, we have a couple of bars coming down and then we have a couple of bars moving up afterwards so the key to this at least for Andre is that we need a couple bars you know prior to the high of volume moving up and then a couple of bars of volume moving down and um, yeah Okay, just a sec. I'm just kind of looking at the examples you gave me. Um, uh, 
Okay, so Andre, looking at your examples, it doesn't look like like the volume has to be stepping up exactly, but just in a general sense, it has to be stepping up. Um, so let's see if I can find an example uh, an example of an exception here. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. So Andre, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, looking at the the data set example of one, three, seven, and then five, six, it looks like even it looks like even even this would count as like as qualifying for a swing high because even though we got this one bar, um, you know, we got this one bar exception where price you know fell down but still moved up in a general sense um, yeah okay all right so even this yeah so even this high point qualifies as a high point even though one bar was a little bit lower but we can see that generally Price is moving up. Um, hmm. Yeah, so determining, you know, those high points and low points in volume. Mm. <laughs> well, let's do a little test. Um, so I want to put the swing indicator on that volume and see if the just the ninja trader swing indicator does it it might actually work um, all right so i'm going to nest the volume in into it okay so there's the volume That's right, yeah. It doesn't quite work on volume, does it? Hmm. Yeah, so I guess the problem I'm seeing here is this high point in volume didn't get found. Um, so I guess I'm just trying to think through of an indicator that can do this. This this would definitely have to be handled by an indicator because it would require, you know, very specific you know mathematical calculations um, and and uh, you know logic to find uh, you know this kind of specific case um, for bloodhound um, you know just kind of keep in mind that really bloodhound is designed to use your indicator data you know and analyze your indicator data bloodhound is not um, like a um, it's not a do-all, end-all, you know, it's a 
mathematics software. You know, Bloodhound is not a mathematics software um, such as something like R um, or Excel. You know, that can do complex math solving things. You know, it's not what Bloodhound is. You know, Bloodhound's there to analyze your, the indicators and and the indicators themselves, you know, do the advanced, um, you know, formula, um, you know, number crunching and, 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 and formulas and stuff. So, so I'm just trying to think of an, yeah, you know, an indicator that may, may work for you here. Um, well, okay, so let's throw on the. Uh, swings, highs, lows, and let's see, number of swings, um, knock that down to two, swing sensitivity down to two, all right, I'm going to feed the volume into the swing high low indicator. doesn't look like that's quite working either because you need at least you want to wait for at least two lower bars afterwards um, let's see hmm. this chart's definitely getting a little messy but um, let's see so I guess you know um, you know, in your opinion, though, does it look like it's picking out, you know, all the low points and high points, even though it's picking them out sometimes too soon? But if it's if if this indicator, you know, if the swing high low indicator is, I guess, you know, the first thing you gotta make sure is that the indicator is picking out all the lows and the highs. Um, you know, that's probably the tougher thing to do. Let's get them all picked out. And if they're all getting picked out correctly, then, you know, what you can do is you can then, um, uh, let's see, add a filter. Um, so you could add other solvers to, let's see, hmm. Yeah, I think this could be done in Bloodhound, but it would really get complex. It would really get complicated. Um, but you could build logic in Bloodhound that, you know, so for example, I guess right here with, you know, this bar, we got a high, um, and then the indicator detected that high immediately after. And... Let's see, yeah, so you could build some logic, you know, that that finds, you know, that, that looks to see, you know, wh what is the gap between the, between the bar, you know, the bar that made the high and how soon the indicator is detecting it. You know, so for example here, you know, we, we, we did actually get a one bar gap, so it waited for the second bar. Um, and you could build some logic to make sure that it, it, it does wait until the second, or actually you probably, so you want two bars to go by, so really you won't know until, uh, I don't know, the third bar, I'm not sure exactly when you're, how far you want to wait, but you could build some logic that looks back, um, think to you know to say okay I think you can build some logic to look back to say okay this volume high was generated one bar back or two bars back or three bars back 
and then you could act on that high. Yeah, because obviously right now the indicators would have you act on that high immediately, but you want to wait. So I think you could count, I think you could, yeah, you can use Bloodhound to identify, you know, which bar the volume high occurred on, and then kind of count two bars afterwards. And then you confirm it by looking at the price value of the indicator, so the blue line. So the value of the indicator, as long as it equals, you know, the value of the volume, then you know you've got a match and you know that the volume has been identified as a high point. So, so there's a couple of, um, you know, a couple of pieces of logic that you're, you're having to build. Um, you know, one piece is that you have to compare the volume to the indicator, um, right? So that tells you that, that there has been a volume bar identified as a high volume bar. Um, because the indicator value and the high of the volume match or the the value of the volume matches and then you had to have another system that counts um, you know that says okay um, the, this you know this volume bar occurred here and then count two bars after and it gets really complex um, It would be so much better if an indicator could do that. And um, gosh, you know, Andre, I'm wondering if maybe somebody on big mics or Ninja Trader have, might have modified um, the Ninja Ninja Swing indicator so that it works on volume correctly. You know, I think that would be the initial thing I would suggest, because that would make things so much easier. Um, you know, to actually find an, an indicator that does this correctly. Uh, hmm. I'm still trying to think through the logic and bloodhound in my head here. Hmm. You know, even with the swing high-low indicator, I'm not sure if even that's going to work correctly for you. Because that indicator requires a certain movement of your data. Um, so to kind of point out what might be a potential issue is you see the indicator didn't pick it up until the third bar after. So I'm not sure if that's problematic for you or not. Um, and we really don't know how many how many volume bars may go by until the low is picked up. It all depends on, on how, how much volume moves. Um, so I guess let me scan through here and see if, if, if there if there does seem to be any uh, places where the volume low is not picked up for like, I don't know, five bars after. Uh, let's see. I'm on range bars, so, you know, different bar types are definitely going to have different behavior. So let's see. So Andre, what bar type are you using? Because that the bar types dramatically alter, you know, the volume. Um, and so altering the volume, you know, uh, kind of behavior will alter how this swing high low indicator is able to detect these highs and lows. All right, so minute-based. All right, 
let's just switch to a minute bar. Well, so far I don't see any dramatic delays. Yeah, it seems like so far the most I see, let's see, we've got one, two, three, a three bar delay. And actually that, let's see, swing sensitivity to, uh, we'll see how that, setting affects this and yeah there we go yep so now all the um, all the low points and high points are determined you know, a lot sooner um, all right so I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that we probably want to set this back to uh, two Yeah, so so far it looks like the longest delay I'm seeing is is three bars. So if that you know if that works for you, I'm just gonna scan through a little bit more. All right, well, I guess we'll just go with this. Um, and, yeah, so let's build, uh, I can, I'll, I can at least build a couple of simple solvers, um, you know, that'll find these high and low points here. Uh, let's see. So what I'm going to use is the comparison solver, right? So what I'm going to be doing is, um, since we need to wait, you know, for two bars, I'm going to be comparing, um, let's see, what's a way to look at this? All right. So let's say this is our, you know, our current bar and boom, we got this high volume, um, you know, it's high volume bar. All right, the next bar generates, um, and essentially what what the solver is going to be doing is it's going to be comparing um, the indicator value to the volume value two bars back, and obviously there's there's no match there, um, so the solver won't give us any any output. We step forward one bar, and now what we're analyzing is, once again, we're analyzing the indicator value of the current bar to the volume of two bars back. And we can see, boom, we've, we've got a match. They're equal. All right? And if we step forward again, what the indicator will be doing is, once again, comparing the indicator value to the volume value uh, two bars back, right? And we can see that there's no longer a match. So every time a new bar is generated, right, the solver, the comparison solver is gonna be doing this type of comparison. And we wanna find when we get these matches like this. All 
right, so the next step is we'll set this solver up. And so in this case, since we're looking to see if, you know, one value equals another value, it really doesn't matter which goes into indicator A or indicator B. Um, but the way I'm processing it in my mind is I'm, um, I'm, I, I think of the swing high-low indicator first and then comparing it to the volume. So just for that reason, I'm going to put the swing high-low in indicator A. Right, and then the next thing I need to do is nest the volume into it. All right, so there we go. So the volume is being fed into the indicator. And I need to change my indicator settings to match what I have on the chart. All right. And okay, so the plot lines that we see on the chart, the blue line is our um, widest tops. So I'll generate a long signal whenever we get a, a, a volume spike. Um, and the magenta plot lines on the bottom here, those are the widest bottoms. And I'll use those to generate a short signal. So if we need to reverse this, we can easily go in here and just reverse these. right? So, but for now, we'll leave it like that. And let's see, I think there's a shortcut. Yep, there's even a shortcut to the volume. So I can change that to the, and, oh, actually, let's see. Now I can't use that shortcut because it doesn't have this, this displacement feature. So I actually have to set this back to indicator and now it has this displacement feature and I will need to use this displacement feature you know to do this two bar look back kind of comparison right so the displacement is, 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 a, is a way of um, of kind of looking back and at, at an indicator value it's not technically it's not looking back what it's actually doing what displacement actually does is it'll take the value of of a bar and the displacement will actually displace it forward. So if I put two in the displacement, it actually takes this value and it shifts it forward in time or displaces it forward in time by two bars. That's what that Ninja Trader feature actually does. Right? So this displacement is um, this is actually a Ninja Trader feature. So whenever you open up any indicator, so if I, for example, actually, yeah, right, so if I open up this moving average, right, I have my EMA selected, right, it has this displacement feature. If I look at the volume, right, the volume indicator on the chart, it also has this displacement feature. So that's essentially what we're doing is we're using this displacement feature in, in inside of Bloodhound to displace the volume indicator value forward two bars so that we, we can do a, a, a comparison. So I'm going to set my displacement to two and next I need to change my indicator to the volume. And then, finally, I need to adjust my outputs here. So we're looking for the indicator value and the volume value to be equal, or in other words, this neutral area. And since, um, since my amounts are set to zero ticks, right, so I have uh, this A greater than B by zero ticks, and A less than B by zero ticks, that means this neutral area is actually is an exact equal. It's an equal. Um,
and it helps if you connect your solver up so you can see the output <laughs> all right there we go it's kind of wondering why we didn't see anything um and yeah all right so just remember there's always a two bar delay all right so um where'd that go okay yeah so this long signal right remember you want a two bar delay so this came from this volume high matching the indicator so we'll kind of step through here and there we go so um, right so we got this volume low here was identified by the indicator and we waited for two bars to go by and we got our short signal and then right afterwards we get this high volume that popped up two bars went by and it identified it with a long signal we step forward here and there we go another short so there's another low in the volume and it matched our indicator two bars later and we got a signal um, yeah so I think that kind of gets the gist of it there for you Andre uh, so if you got any comments or anything on this uh, yeah just let me know I think this kind of gets gets you gets you in the ballpark of what you're looking for you know so you've identified all these volume lows and highs and you know, I guess combined with your other logic and stuff, you know, it ought to filter out a lot of these, you know, signals that we're getting here because we're definitely getting a lot of highs and lows in the volume. So I'm sure this is just a small component of what you're building. I guess just to kind of note, if you needed to, you know, needed, uh, wanted an extra bar to go by, we can change our displacement to 3. And, um, so there we go. I'll point this out. So we got this volume high and we waited for two bars to go by and then actually well actually we waited for three bars to go by um, and then got got our signal here so um, so if you if you're wanting more more bars to go by to kind of confirm these highs and lows so as you're changing this displacement you'll also you know need to make sure that you go in and change your indicator sensitivity as well so that way the indicator is detecting less highs and lows you know as you're wanting more more bars to go you know more bars in front of the high and more bars after the high uh, right uh, that that can be determined by changing the indicator parameter as well so and like I said if you wanted to reverse these so say you're looking for a short signal on a volume high you can just reverse those and there we go now we got a reversal so now we got a short signal here from this volume high All right. Um, Okay, good. Well, um, wow, there's a lot of people st stayed in here for this one. <laughs> so, all right, guys. Well, that wraps it up. Um, yeah, there, let's see. Uh, doesn't look like there are any other, yeah, questions in here um, after Andre. So, all right, guys. Well, that does it for this Friday workshop. And um, I wish you guys 
you know, a lot of success for 2015. I hope this year goes well for you. Seems like the economy's doing better and better, so that's kind of good for everybody. And, uh, you know, hopefully it uh, does good for the market as well, for all of us. So 